morning, everybody. Seems like everybody's here now, at least a good number. So I guess we should get started. I have a pretty full uh, stack to show. So um, it's better that we don't delay the start. Um, so my name is Arnaud de Haas. I'm from IBM. I'm part of the Open Technology Group. Uh, I'm an open source, open standard specialist. I spend most of my career working on the web-related technologies, mostly involved with Direct3C. And, uh, but the last three years now, I've been focusing most of my time uh, uh, on, the, on blockchain technology, and especially within Hyperledger project. So I'm a contributor to the Hyperledger Fabric project, and uh, I'm an elected member to the Technical Steering Committee, which oversees the general technical direction of the project. And just briefly on this, you know, people tend to think Hyperledger is a software that you use. It's not. It's a consortium. Okay? It's basically a consortium where people are invited to come and develop in open source, open, you know, um, blockchain related technologies. So Hyperledger Fabric is one of the projects that is being developed within Hyperledger. There are actually up to like five different frameworks now with different characteristics uh, um, being developed within Hyperledger. And this afternoon, after lunch, I have a keynote on self-sovereign identity where we'll talk about another project called Hyperledger Indy. So, Hyperledger Fabric, what is this about? So, I have, it's pretty technical. This is a technical conference. I was asked to go more technical, and I'm happy to do that. I have a few slides for in, to introduce where all this comes from. I assume most people, so I kind of looked with interest the, the little survey that uh, Sebastian had earlier on who had, had much experience. The question that wasn't asked is, is there anybody who is new to blockchain? I assume they would have left, oh no, we have, see, see, we do, thank you. Um, no, no, no shame, everybody has to learn at some point to start. So, uh, so obviously there's a lot of hype around blockchain, this big buzzword. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of perspective as to how IBM came into the blockchain arena and, you know, because it really has driven a specific way uh, of addressing the problem, which is quite different from most of the other blockchain uh, technologies that are out there. And so Hyperledger Fabric is an open source project developed within Hyperledger, as I was saying. It was contributed initially, it was based on the initial contribution from IBM, and IBM remains one of the main contributors to the project, but we're not the only ones by, uh, by any means. But so, um, of course, IBM has a big research center. We have people who have experts in cryptography and, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networking and all this good stuff. And so, of course, they had a very, you know, keen interest in blockchain when Bitcoin started. Uh, but, you know, from uh, IBM is, and maybe we are part of the boring people who are working on the not so exciting uh, <laughs> use cases, but, you know, we are very enterprise focused. And so our interest was really like, well, what's in this that we could actually use from an enterprise point of view? And we realized that, okay, so fundamentally blockchain is this notion of shared ledger. Ledgers are not by any means new. Businesses have been using ledgers to keep a record of their transactions that they you know, have and the operations of their company. Uh, for hundreds of years, literally. What's new is this notion of shared ledger that blockchain is all about. So the problem with the traditional scenario, and so I have a few slides that are non-technical to kind of give the basic picture and then we'll get into the more technical stuff. So fundamentally, that's the traditional scenario we are facing today. And every participant in a business network will have its own system of record that is maintained independently of the rest of the network. Everything works fine as long as everything works fine. The problem is, if there is something that goes wrong, there is no universal source of truth. Everybody is going to, you basically enter this process of reconciliation where essentially you're comparing notes and you're trying to figure out what went wrong, who did fail to do something that was supposed to happen, right? And because there is no 
universal source of truth. You know, there is no central uh, repository for the information. Everybody has their own version of the truth. And then you have to figure out how these things compare. This process is inefficient, it's expensive. And so blockchain, essentially, what I like to say is it enforces reconciliation up front. So the, essentially, what, you, what blockchain gives you is the ability for all the participants to re retain their own version of the, I mean, the, the, their own copy of the ledger, but the system will enforce that all the different copies are actually kept in sync. So before you actually write anything to the ledger, you'll go through this consensus process that says, okay, we all agree this is happening now, and we can write that down. And that solves a lot of problems, okay? Finally, this is what it's all about. So now, this is not just science fiction. And, you know, IBM has been doing that for quite a few years. We were, I'm happy to say we were one of the pioneers in looking into blockchain from an enterprise point of view. And so we have now several projects that are actually in production. One of the earliest projects is Everledger. It's a company that developed a platform uh, to, which runs on Hyperledger Fabric uh, to trace diamonds. So they actually have developed a fingerprinting technology based on the physical characteristic of the stone. At the mining operation, they scan the stone, they come up with a, basically a digital signature for that uh, uh, stone, and they can record that on the chain. And from then on, they're going to keep trace of that, uh, of that diamond throughout the whole supply chain, and every agent Every participant in the big business network that involves, you know, uh, people who do like certification of quality, of course, the people who are actually going to cut the stone, uh, the, the, the shipping people, all these different actors are actually going to add information to the blockchain related to this ID, okay? And that all the way to the retail store, so that in the retail store you could actually pick up a diamond, scan it if you have the machine, you know, get its ID, and then you would be able to query the system and find out the provenance of that stone and everything that has happened. We have another platform called Food Trust, which we initially developed with, by, with Walmart, but it's been extended now, even Carrefour just joined. Um, and uh, it is a similar notion of tracking things, but now it's about, you know, basically tracing the origin of uh, food products. And so, for instance, you know, the idea is that you had a farm, chicken farm, you can tag the chicken, each chicken has a unique ID on a tag, and after that you can scan you know, the, 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 the chicken as it progresses through the supply chain so that all the way to the retail store, you could scan the, the chicken on the, uh, on the shelf and know where it, which farm it come from and how it actually got there. It actually has some very interesting applications, including in the case of contamination. Today, when there's contamination in one farm, there's a bit of a panic because nobody knows where the chicken that come from that farm actually are. So you have these massive recalls that are very wasteful because they basically throw out tons of chicken that have nothing to do with the farm in question. But nobody knows how to do otherwise. And so there's actually an IoT component to this also because the tag can have a temperature sensor and you know that in the food industry, one aspect is the cold chain, ensuring that the, chain, the, 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 the food has been kept within certain temperature uh, range. And so the, the tag can be uh, measuring and storing information that is then put on the chain so that you can also check this kind of information. Last example I will give you today is uh, called TradeLens. It's a platform we developed with Maersk. Maersk is the biggest uh, shipping company in the world, container. And uh, what's interesting is, you know, it's pretty obvious that if you think of a company that ships container, you think their biggest problem is to ship the containers, making sure that the container goes from point A to point B. Actually, that's the easiest part for them. The hardest part is the paper trail all the documents that they have to actually manage and accumulate over the period of time during the shipment. Of course, it goes its own route, which is independent from the container. 
they actually have to accumulate up to 30 signatures in stamp while a container goes from one point in the pla on the planet to another one. And so we developed a platform uh, which basically allows to keep track of the containers, but of course every container has an ID, they already have that, so that part is already taken care of. But now all the information that relates to that container can be added to the chain. This involves many different actors. So of course there is Maersk itself, but they operate a huge network which involves many different participants. That includes transporters, that includes insurance companies, tax authorities, customs, port authorities. So all along the way, you know, all these different actors have to play a role at a certain point in time, right? And so now we can gather all that information on the chain so that you can always look at it. Of course, government agencies love this because it reduces fraud, it gives us auditability, so you can actually go back and look what happened to a container. So, that's for the examples. This is the kind of use cases that we had in mind when we said, okay, we want to develop uh, something for the enterprise. And when we started, we were not especially keen on developing our own framework. We would have been happy to take one that existed, but there was just one, there, there just wasn't one that exactly fit the bill. Primarily, as Ingo mentioned earlier, the most, you know, a lot of the networks that are out there, they actually are public and they, are, uh, they provide no privacy. They are anonymous or pseudonymous and um, they, have, they are of very poor performance. They lack finality. That's something that is little known but yet so important. So in Bitcoin and Ethereum has the same problem. Even when the block has been added to the chain with your transaction in it, you don't know if it's going to stick or not. Because the system is such that it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. Different blocks can be added at different parts of the network. So you effectively have branches that get created. And the, the system is such that it says, well, you know, we keep broadcasting all the blocks all around. And if you ever receive a block that's on a branch longer than the one you happen to be on, you need to switch over. And the system of reward is actually meant to make you, there's an actual incentive to do that as well. But that means that there's never a guarantee that the block that has your transaction is going to actually stick. And even so, there are heuristics, but there's actually no like deterministic way to know when your block is really going to stick. So heuristics, you know, in the case of Bitcoin, people people say that you should take a, wait about three blocks. It takes 10 minutes to make one block. Now three blocks is 30 minutes. And if you have a business and you really worry about not starting shipping products, for instance, before they really are paid or ordered, you have to wait longer. And so in sensitive businesses, they wait 10 blocks. Now 10 times 10 minutes, that's 100 minutes. And yet, you're not even sure because there have been times when they were doing upgrades and something went wrong and things didn't converge anymore and they started diver diverging. And then of course there also are problems like in the case of the DAO, if you're uh, familiar with Ethereum, there was a major problem, there was a security violation, somebody actually managed to siphon a lot of money and so the community said, whoa, wait, 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 <laughs> let's stop. So they stopped everything and then they, after a lot of discussion, they say, no, we're going to rewind this story, which is completely counter the whole idea, right? And they say, we're going to fork and start over from before that happened to eliminate those transactions that should never have happened in the first place. And of course, all the people who had submitted transactions that had nothing to do with this said, excuse me, now you're going to reverse all my transaction? No, thank you very much. I don't care that some people got screwed and had the money stolen. It doesn't concern me. So they stuck with their branch. So now there are two branches. And this keeps happening all the time. So obviously, you know, this is kind of in, uh, characteristic that we wanted to have in the frame, in the system. So we wanted a system that is 
permission, so we control access, because the reality is businesses do not function anonymously. They function in a business network. They want to have privacy, but they know the participants in the network. Most of those you know, public networks are actually have the opposite characteristics. They are, they are public, anybody can join, and on the other hand, they have no privacy. Everybody sees what everybody else is doing. Because again, you know, and, and Ingo pointed that out, there, there's this notion that you, know, you have an ID and you use that ID to do a transaction. If you send me a Bitcoin, you're going to reveal your ID when you do that. And now I can go back to the chain and find all the transactions you've ever done with that ID and all the transactions you're going to do from then on. And over time, I can build a Rolodex and know everybody. Right? So... Again, you know, in the, in the business case, uh, this is really the opposite of what people want to do. What's interesting is it also is the cause of the lack of performance. Ingo talked about the waste of energy related to proof of work. It's actually a misnomer to call it waste. It, it, waste implies that, you know, it doesn't fulfill any function. It does fulfill a key critical function in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Because if you remove proof of work, the whole system will collapse. Because this is what prevents people from rewriting his story, at least, you know, unless you fork the whole thing. So once you actually know the participants, you control access, you can get rid of proof of work altogether and get much better performance. So to give you an idea, you know, uh, Bitcoin is like seven transactions uh, per second, and, and we have like of the order of 2,000 to 3,000 transactions a second. And Ethereum, I think, is 15, 15 transactions at this point. So, again, we have, so talking about Hyperledger Fabric, so this is the kind of you know, framework we are in. Uh, key characteristic of permission, we control access. And by the way, another aspect is, the problem with anonymous public networks is that if somebody plays bad, you know, becomes a bad agent and they're trying to screw with the system, you have very little means to stop them because they're anonymous. You don't know who they are. In a, pub, in a, in a private permission network where you actually know the participants, typically you actually have contracts with those people because they are people you actually trade with and they are not anonymous. So if they really were to start screwing around with the system, first of all, you can revoke access because you control that. And then you can actually have other recourse, like legal. You can literally sue them if needed. Okay? So this kind of gives you an idea of the mismatch you know, there is between public uh, anonymous blockchain networks and basically what we have identified being the needs for the enterprise. So it has led us to uh, develop Fabric. It is permissioned, it's highly modular. So, you know, IBM has a long history working on enterprise. We've learned a long time ago that there isn't a one solution fit all. So we wanted to make the system very flexible. When it comes to smart contracts, there are different approaches. So in Ethereum, which is, you know, the, they created this idea of smart contracts, which basically runs the logic of the application on the network and ensure the integrity of the transactions and that of the, the, the overall uh, process flow. Uh, the Ethereum chose to limit the instructions that you can have by uh, basically supporting uh, an Ethereum virtual machine that defines which instructions are supported by the network. And this is primarily done for security reason to try to limit the, the risk uh, of uh, attacks. And so we decided to take a different approach, which is to support general purpose languages. And so we support different of them and di different ones. And there, we actually achieve the security aspect in a different way. They are containerized and they run in a separate container that's isolated. So we provide privacy, and I'll get back more onto this later. 
And then uh, we have no mining. So that's another aspect. You know, we actually have a lot of customers who have ex started experimenting with Ethereum. And in Ethereum, there's this notion of gas. There's the notion of mining to reward the validators. And when you're running a business like shipping containers, all of this is a distraction because your business is not centered around making money out of running a net blockchain network and validating transaction. It's actually about shipping containers. So we actually don't have that aspect at all. And then there's another part which is more uh, fundamental and that I will get more into details now about the, the consensus process itself, which is quite different and again provides better performance and finality. So we had many different revisions. I'm not going to get into the detail. What's interesting is that we started uh, earlier in 2015. Uh, we had uh, an IBM version that we open sourced and then we contributed it to Hyperledger which started in 2016. And then in 2017 with the first major version, 1.0. And since then we have been releasing new revision about every quarter. What's interesting is to see the number of developers that we have now contributing, the number of companies. So it's by no means no longer just an IBM project. And this is actually a key aspect of Hyperledger. Hyperledger as an organization insists on the fact that we're not just doing open source, the kind of open source where you throw code onto a GitHub repository, but you keep the control. We are actually into building an open governance with an open community that controls the, the code and the direction. So <clears throat> let's look now a little bit more into what constitutes a hyperledger uh, archi fabric archi architecture. So I'm going to take you through a little bit of the main elements that constitutes a, a framework of network and uh, their roles and take you through a process flow of a transaction. So <clears throat> on the left there, you have the client application, which interacts with the network, typically through an SDK. We have different kinds. There is an important aspect which is up there. It's the membership services. And don't get fooled by the fact that it's represented by a single box. It's really, a, it's really uh, uh, distributed. Each uh, organization in the network can have its own. So it's by no means a central uh, service. Um, but this will deal with all the certificates and enrollment. Basically, this is how you get access into the system. Because again, we are in a permission network where you control access. And then at the bottom, we have what you typically find as part of a peer in a blockchain network. But what we have found, and that was a big difference between the earlier version of Fabric, we started with 0506 in Hyperledger, and we, uh, we did a complete redesign of Fabric with 1.0 because we realized that what was in the peer, there were actually three different primary functions that could be separated at least logically, and in fact, even from an implementation point of view. And so those three aspects are endorsement, which is the endorser there. There is a part which has to do with committers. This is the part that actually deals with the, uh, the, uh, the actual ledger. And then there's a part which has to do with ordering. So I'm going to take you through the process and you'll better understand. And as you can tell, basically we have separated the ordering function of the peer from the rest. The other two are technically, they are implemented in the same server, the same uh, peer, but logically they have two different functions. So the process is such. First, the application will enroll. They get a certificate, that's a signature that will give them access to the network. Based on that, they can submit a proposal for a transaction to the peer. The peer will then endorse the transaction by executing the chain code or smart contract. We call it chain code in Fabric. If it, if it succeeds, then you know, it will return an endorsement. There's endorsement policies. I'll get into that later. Once the, they have enough endorsements, the application will then submit the transaction with all the endorsements to the ordering service. And again, you know, there are four nodes there. It's a cluster of nodes. 
the exact topology is completely application dependent, depends on configuration of your system. The ordering service, what does it do? It collects all the transactions that are being submitted by the network and then casts the new block. And it will do that based on a certain amount of time that has been, that has, uh, been elapsed or a certain number of transactions that have accumulated. This again is a cluster and it uses different algorithm to decide on the ordering of the transaction. What's key is that it decides of an order. Then once it has a block, it will actually deliver that block in the form of batch, right, to the, to, to the peers. So the peers will then actually do a second validation. This is a very quick validation. It's a check that says, are the conditions under which the transactions were validated in the first place when they were endorsed at the execution in step two still, you know, the same? So either they are the same and then the transaction is validated or they are not and it's flagged as invalid. Either way, the block gets then committed to the, to the ledger and an event is being sent to let everybody know that there's a new block. So again, you'll know that once that happens, everybody is on the same page. Everybody receives the new block and there is no like possible froky, forking or any of this happening. So what does it mean for the application developer, which should be of most interest to you guys? A lot of the gory detail is taken care of by the framework itself, thankfully. So for instance, the actual blockchain, you don't have to worry too much about it. You can if you want to, but you don't have to. There are really two parts that you worry about as an application developer. There is, of course, the client application side, which is the interaction with the SDK. And then on the, on the server side, so to speak, is the smart contract, the chain code. These are the two pieces that you're really going to be focusing on. And in practice, there are very basic functions that you're going to call to do that. And um, all the details of what's happening with the network and underneath is being taken care of by either the SDK on the client side or the peer underneath the smart contract. So, and maybe I should switch to the other side. There is actually two parts to the ledger. The ledger is really stored in two forms. There is the actual blockchain, which is what you would expect. So the ordering service creates a new block, sends it to all the peers, and you're going to add that block to the chain. That's the actual storage. But, you know, like your bank account, when you receive a bank statement, you don't have to go back to the origin of your bank account when you opened it to look at what the balance is. It also tells you what the current balance is, thankfully, right? And so the world state is basically the snapshot of the current state of the data. Practically speaking, what that means is that from an application point of view in your chain code, all you're going to do is add change values into a, a database, which is a key value pair system. By default, it's level DB because Fabric is written in Go and level DB is a built-in uh, 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 key value pair test store that's supported in Go. But there are options to use different uh, storage, including CouchDB, that provides richer capabilities. But so, from an application point of view, again, from your chain code, what you're going to do is do simply puts and deletes and gets to the database, very much like you would do on a regular database. And you're going to say, wait, wait, I thought it was immutable. Of course, it's immutable at the blockchain level, but the world state itself is not, because if you couldn't change any values, that wouldn't be very useful. What happens really is that you're going to interact with the ledger through your chain code API, you're going to do puts and gets, and automatically Fabric underneath is going to figure out, okay, what does it mean from a transaction point of view, what is actually changing between the, the beginning of the chain code execution and the end. And this is actually what's going to be sent out 
It's a read-write set for those who are familiar with this, what that means. So let's look a little bit more into you know, the different pieces. So I mentioned that there are functionally three different types of peers. As you've seen, I mean, two, the, the first two are really into a single one. But they, they are committing peers. They are the ones who actually just manage the ledger. And they may do nothing else. But they can also support chain code and take part of the endorsement uh, um, aspect of the consensus. And then there's ordering nodes that focuses only on the ordering. There's a question. Sure. <clears throat> okay. So the question is, uh, so if you use CouchDB, you can have access to CouchDB as a server thing, and so you could access it indirectly or directly, rather, right with that, you know, bypassing completely fabric and, and fudge with the information that's there. And that is true. But the thing is, you're only dealing with one copy, right? You would have to be able to access every copy of every participant in the network and make the same change everywhere to be able to actually make it stick. And on top of it, the world state is actually an image of what's in the blockchain. And if your peer, for instance, breaks down, you might sometimes have to rebuild the world state. The idea is like, just like your balance on your bank account, right? You can always recalculate the balance. If you want to start from the beginning, you would read all the operations, you would end up with the same number. So the world state is just an image of the current state, a snapshot of the current state of the data. It doesn't actually change the data because the blockchain itself is protected by the cryptographic aspect of the, the blockchain that I assume everybody is familiar with, where all the blocks are signed and, and there is encapsulation, etc. So. Yeah, if you have any doubt or if there is any corruption of the world state, you can always recalculate it. And if you start from scratch, you won't get the world state. If you start a new peer, it will get connect to the network, it will get the actual blocks, and then it will rebuild its world state automatically. Yes, it is. There is a way because you could possibly access the CouchDB server and, 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 and screw with the data, but it, it would actually not, you know, propagate through the network at all. So it's not, resi you know, it's not resilient. Well, self-heal, I don't know if that would go that far. Uh, probably some admin person would have to say, wait, there's a problem there. You could start having errors. The, the node would be isolated from the rest because it would get out of sync with the network. And then somebody would have to actually have, you know, do some operation. <clears throat> so... As I was saying, the commuter peers, they're just managing the, 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 a copy of the ledger. Endorsing peers, they have chain code, they can execute smart contract and participate in the endorsement process. And ordering nodes uh, actually uh, do the ordering. The part of the reason we separated the ordering is because we realized that a lot of what's referred to as the consensus, you know, it really has to do with this notion of, of deciding as a whole on the network of a specific order of the transaction. Because again, we're in a peer-to-peer -peer network, different points in the network can submit different transactions at the same time, and they all arrived in different orders at every point in the network. So at some point, we need to agree on a certain order. And that's very important because, uh, specifically for the, the, the case of the proof, uh, sorry, double spent, right? So the problem is this. If I have a dollar and I say I'm submitting a transaction, I give it to Joe, and then I have a, that, that same dollar, I submitted a transaction that say I give it to Bob. Obviously, only one of those transactions can be uh, granted. But at the endorsement level, the chain code is going to run some code saying something like, does Arno have a dollar to spend? Yeah, okay, we know Joe, okay, I, he can give that uh, dollar to Joe. And so it will endorse the transaction. And then 
the uh, or the proposal of a transaction at that point. And then the same will happen with the second transaction. And they can happen in very different parts of the network on top of it, remember that. So at some point, they're all going to converge to the ordering service. The ordering service, which again is a network of nodes that use a specific algorithm to agree on the order of the transaction, will say, well, one is before the other. And that's how you're going to detect at the validation stage, the last step, when the, the block is cast, it actually has those two transactions, or they could be in two different blocks, depending on the timing. But eventually, it will be broadcasted, and then there will be this second check, and this is when we are going to detect, wait, the first transaction can be honored, but the second one cannot, because Arnold doesn't have that dollar anymore. He can only give it once, okay? So this is referred to the, uh, double spend. What's interesting is, you know, consensus algorithm, there are many different ones, and it's a field of research, and so that was an aspect we wanted to make sure we were open about, so we could enable different algorithm and, and be open to the future to be able to uh, adapt to uh, new uh, algorithm as they become available. So by default, there's a solo. It's actually not for production. It's just a single node, literally, and it's just for development purposes. But for production, we actually have an ordering, ordering service based on Kafka, which is crash fault tolerant. So if you're familiar with blockchain, the big word is Byzantine fault tolerant. And so we do not have that today, but I'll talk a bit more. There's development and this happening. So. I'd said that one of the key characteristics that drew, drove the development of Fabric was privacy. And initially we thought, well, we do permission network, that's good enough, right? We give privacy, but it's not enough. As soon as we engaged the customer, we realized that even within a given network, people wanted to have privacy among themselves with subgroups, depending on the transactions. So they're all part of the same network, but depending on the transaction, they only want some people to see it. So we introduced the notion of channels. It basically allows you to segment the network. It's essentially a different chain. So every time you create a new channel, you essentially create a new, ch a new uh, chain. And we had discussion back then, do we call them channels or chains? We settled on channels because we thought that was something that people were familiar with. If you use IRC or Slack, you have this notion of channels, and you, once you access it, you see everything in it. It's similar to this. So this is an example of a network with, which has multiple channels. So they're represented here. Um, with the colors, so you can see E0 is on a red channel, and E2 and E1 are on the blue channels, and then E3 is on both. Then there's this notion of smart contract, again, the chain code that runs, it's associated to channels, and you can mix and match as much as you want. But the key point is, you can isolate the transaction, the visibility of each peer, what each participant sees, right, from one another. So when you install chain code, there's two operations. And you know, chain code, there's also the question of what, what exactly goes in the chain code. As I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's, it functions two key parts. Uh, one is integrity of the data. When a transaction is being submitted, does it have all the data that I need to make sense of this transaction? So for instance, if I'm, again, giving money from one person to another, do, do those people are, are those people identified in a way I can actually process this transaction, right? Um, and, and then there's, you know, does that transaction make sense at this point in time in the logic of the application, which is obviously application dependent? And how much you, you know, a lot of people are dreaming of very complex smart contracts. You know, the jury is out as to how complex you want that to be. Uh, this is run on every transaction. It can be quite uh, expensive. Uh, but so you need to be careful not to make that too complex. One way to think about it is, you know, is store procedures. If you have database uh, background, you should know what that is. And, you know, if you know what 
Maybe if you're old enough, you know what happened with stop procedures. When they were inter introduced, people thought this was gold, and they went nuts with stop procedures and started moving most of the code they had in the, ac in the application into the database server in the form of stop procedures, and things went very bad. And then people said, okay, maybe not go that far, and we've learned that stop procedures need to be used in a very you know, smart way. It, it, you, know, you have to be fairly uh, minimalistic about what you're going to handle and install procedures. I claim that, you know, people have different opinions on this, that's why I see the jury is still out. I claim that we'll see something similar happen for blockchain, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, so, one aspect that's important to know is that when it comes to fabric, there are actually two different operations that need to take place for a smart contract, the chain code, to actually start, you know, uh, uh, operating. There's a first uh, operation where you install the chain code. It basically is like loading the code into the peer where you want to use it. And then there's, you instantiate the chain code, which basically associates the chain code with a specific channel. The reason we have those two is because you can reuse the same chain code on several channels. So the cost is actually much slower the second time around because you just associate the same chain code to a different channel uh, and the, the, you don't have to load it again. <clears throat> so I talked about the endorsement. And so, by the way, let me say a little bit more about endorsement policies because, again, you know, a lot of blockchain networks out there, anybody can participate in validation. But the reality is it isn't so. In business networks, typically, there are different actors that have different roles. And based on the transaction, they have a say or not into whether it's valid or not. And so there are even regulations sometimes that come into play and they require certain information to be endorsed by certain participants in the network and not others. So we have actually designed the system so that at the application level you can specify for your network who is actually going to endorse slash validate transactions. So again, this is the very beginning of the process where the client submitted a proposed transaction. So you're going to specify a policy, endorsement policy for your channel. It's per channel. And I'm going to switch to the example because I think it's much more powerful. And uh, basically, we have a simple uh, policy language which allows you to define who in the network has to endorse a transaction for that transaction to be considered valid. This will be actually checked by the ordering service. I mentioned earlier that you know the client is going to actually ha collect endorsement. Is the client has to fulfill that that policy? So it's a very simple language with an and and an or, and that's good enough to actually address most of the cases. You can say things like you know to for a transaction to be endorsed. Uh, to, to be considered valid, acceptable by the ordering s service, it has to be endorsed by all the organizations, or just one or two, and you can combine that as much as you want. You can see how that goes. <clears throat> Another key aspect that I referred to earlier is the membership service provider. So again, we are in a permission network, and so it's important to deal with identities, and so what we have done is we have basically made it possible, we call that bring your own identity. We made it possible to integrate Fabric with many different identity systems that are out there. As you can imagine, you know, most people are not keen on creating a whole new bunch of user IDs to deal with the new system. And so we made it possible to bring identities from your legacy systems. So there are actually two parts to this. There is the, what we call the local MSP for membership service providers. And there is a possibility to actually run the system without any server. You can actually just put all the cryptographic material on disk and make sure that the peer is able to access this or all the different elements in the system that need to have access to it. And they'll be able to interact with the, 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 with the network. But 
we actually have, by default, there's a server, an which is called the Fabric CA for Certificate Authority, which supports integration with, many, with quite a few uh, different uh, legacy systems like LDAP, which will allow you to, again, bring uh, identities, certificates. It's all based on certificates, right, X5019. Uh, certificates. So again, this is where, you know, um, you will go to enroll initially, get the certificate of enrollment, and this is what the client will use to uh, participate in the system. I actually have this on this slide. Um, so through the Fabric CA client, which is basically, you know, it's through the, uh, the some SDK, an admin will be able to enroll, get the user ID, uh, I mean, enrollment ID, basically, kind of a user ID for the, the user, and give that to the user so that the user can then access the system. Everything that happens, every step that I talked about earlier, actually involves signatures. So it's not just the client that has actually to enroll and get certificates to be able to participate in the system. Every component, whether they're ordering nodes, whether they are peers, endorser, endorser, sorry, endorsing peers or committing peers, every piece in the system is going to have certificate and is going to sign everything they do. So it's very expensive in terms of cryptographic because you're going to sign everything throughout the process and every step of the way you check that all the signatures that you receive are actually valid, right? I'm going to say more on this now. So, time goes fast. I have 15 minutes left. What I want to do for the last few minutes is give you a bit of insight as to what's happening in terms of development. So I gave you quickly, and I'm sorry, it's a bit of a rush, I realize that. I have many, many more slides that go into a lot more details, but it would take two, three, four hours, and we don't have that today. So I, I tried to give you a quick overview so you have an idea of what's behind the curtain. Uh, for most people, you don't have to worry too much about all the details. Um, it depends also on the role you have. We do identify there are primarily two types of people who are going to interact with the fabric system. There's network operators that deal with all the topology of the network, the certificates, they have to worry about this stuff. And then application developers typically don't worry about all this stuff. They focus on their chain code and the application part. But so, where are we going? What is going on with the development? Because we've been busy. Uh, I talked about earlier how we had uh, Fabric 1.0 in July 2017, and since then we've been releasing uh, new versions every quarter. And so what is happening? And I wanted to give you a little bit of insight as to what's happening on that front. So essentially, first, you need to know that even though, I mean, when we started, we didn't have a, a clear uh, timeline for the roadmap. We used to have like a free <laughs> show where it's like, hey, what do you want? What feature do you want in the next version? And oh, I'm working on this, I want this, and I want that. And, and it was a bit of a zoo. And so it took very long time because the, the like Fabric 1.0 had a lot baked into it. And then the same happened with 1.1. And then we said, wait a minute, we can't keep doing this. It's taking too long between versions. So as a community, we agreed to switch to a time-based roadmap where we have a release cycle where every quarter we're going to release a new version. It's a minor version, right? So it's X.123. And then um, we've been trying to stick to this. So 1.1, one, one, see, I, I said we, we had 1.0 in July 2017, and then 1.1 one, one came, 1.0 uh, was 2017, and 1.1 one, one took like six months plus. And so that's why we said we can't keep doing this. So since then, we've been pretty good. So we just released version 1.3. It was in October. It was a bit later because if you know how to count, 
October is actually a month late. It should have been in September, but uh, there were different factors, including a hurricane in North Carolina, where there is a major IBM center where we do a lot of the tests for the community. And so we actually had to shut down every servers during the weekend because the hurricane was coming. And so it actually, we incurred some delays. And so we, d we agreed to just delay by a week or two. And so, but the release is out. And I encourage you to check it out. Fabric 1.3 is the important one. However, we were left with the, the you know, two months basically for, for the 1.4. And there were discussions, should we have 1.4 in January or do we still try to stick to the schedule? The agreement among the maintainers was to stick with the schedule and to keep 1.4 fairly light. There is one important aspect. So the reason it's light, right, is because it's the holidays at the end of the year, so you already have a shorter quarter, and we started late, so we got shortened on both sides, <laughs> which makes it a bit of a challenge. But the community decided to stick to uh, the schedule and rather keep the, the, the version light to stick it into the time frame we have. So one important aspect, I'm not going to get through all the details, although I'll give you a little bit more insight as to what goes on into 1.4. What's important is to know that 1.4 is going to be the first long-term support version for Fabric. We haven't had any of those, so for those who are not familiar, this means that up to now, if you have a problem with Fabric, and we, you, you're going to be told, which version do you use? Oh, 1.1, one, one. shh, upgrade. <laughs> and we're not going to make any effort to patch the bug that you may have found in 1.1 or 1.2 every time you're being told to upgrade to the latest version. Of course, we all know that this is not practical. When people start going in production and all, they want a bit more stability. And if there are real bugs, they want to be able to have fixes for the bugs without disrupting the whole system. So this is what we call long-term support, where we actually commit to keep, uh, to maintain a, a version. So 1.4 is going to be the first uh, such version for Fabric, and it will be released by the end of the year. Um, so I don't have the time to go through all the different features, but so instead I'm going to give you some kind of, you know, general look on the, the, the main axis of development that I see, uh, that I see happening in, in the fa on Fabric in general. So first, you know, in terms of privacy and confidentiality, which I said, you know, is a very important aspect. So we started with this notion of permission network, as I said, we introduced then channels. But guess what? This is yet not enough for a lot of people. One aspect that's interesting is that when you send the transaction after endorsement to the ordering service, the ordering service has access to the payload of the information. And the ordering service, even though it's a network of nodes that decentralized in and of itself, from a network point of view, it is a central point. And it actually has access to all the channels. That means there are people who are not easy with that because they say, well, whoever has access to the ordering nodes has access to all the transactions, including, you know, on, on all the channels. So people have reverted to doing private transaction, the hard way, which is essentially you say, well, I'm not going to put the actual data on the transaction. I'm going to hash the data, put the hash, and I'll keep the data off the chain. Problem with that is, well, the other participants in the network don't get the off the chain data. And if you want to do that, the application level is kind of a pain. So what we did is we actually introduced a mechanism that allows you to do this automatically. So we introduced this notion of private transaction. So at the chain code level, there are actually two different APIs now. There's one where you just put data, and there's a, put pri a private put, if you will, which says put the data on the, on the, uh, in the database, but don't send the payload of the, the, the actual data into the transaction. It's also referred to, for those who have seen maybe some references, to what's called SciDB, because essentially what the peer does, it creates a side database where the actual data is stored. And so it does the hashing for you. It puts the hash in the transaction. And this is what's going to go through the ordering service. The difference is the peer will actually connect with all the other peers that are part of that 
So we have a notion of collection. You define who is part of the collection. And so it will actually connect directly through gossip protocol to all the other peers and synchronize their site DB with the other peers. So you essentially have a free, you know, off the chain, synchronized off the chain storage backed by the chain, which has the hash. And so you can still have, you know, a transaction you can refer to. We actually didn't stop there because there's another aspect. For those who were there, maybe in the Fabric 0506, we had introduced the notion of uh, transaction certificates. So the idea is that a bit like, you know, in the, the situation I was referring to earlier with the Bitcoin network, when you sign everything, that means if people know your signature, they see all the transactions on the channel, if they have access, right? They see all the transactions that you sign. And maybe they, you don't want them to see that. So in 06, we had introduced this notion of transaction certificate, or basically you could re-enroll with the, the Fabric CA, get a new certificate for about every transaction. And so that way, there is no correlation possible between the different transactions because they all appear to be signed by somebody else. But this was actually, from a privacy point of view, still not ideal because there's complexity. I don't have time to get into all the details. But if you want to have um, true privacy, uh, you need more. So we have actually introduced a technology which is actually made available. This is a big part of uh, uh, Fabric 1.3 and 1.4. It's uh, based on an IBM technology called Identity Mixer, or ID Mix for short, which provides anonymous transactions where you can actually hide literally the identity of the, of the, the, the submitter of the transaction and actually uses zero-knowledge proof to do the check of the identity. And there's a further development that's happening that won't happen now, but there will uh, work underway called Zero Knowledge Asset Transfer, or ZCAT for short. And actually mixes UTXO and Identity Mixer. So that, I mean, if you're familiar with Bitcoin and UTXO, so there are two different models. There is, you know, Ethereum as contracts, and then there is uh, Bitcoin as UTXO. I don't have time to get into the detail. I hope you guys are familiar with this. But so Zcat is kind of a, you know, reusing UTXO model, but adding privacy to it. On the consensus part, we, as I said, are currently supporting Kafka. Uh, it's crash fault tolerant, it's not Byzantine fault tolerant. So Byzantine fault tolerant, for those who don't know, it's a way to, uh, you know, keep the system working even if there are a certain number of agents, uh, participants in the system that are bad actors. And so <clears throat> we don't have that, and it's not been a priority for business network because, again, they know who they work with, so typically we don't get into the scenario where people really play, try to screw with the system. And as I said, we have other means. But still, for completeness, if nothing else, we would like to have it. So as a first step, there's, a, there's work underway to implement Raft. So Raft is still only crash fault tolerant. But the, the step is seen as an intermediary step for two reasons. First, it's an exercise to make sure that, you know, even though we designed the ordering service to be to have this consensus algorithm pluggable, it's like, well, is that real? Well, it turns out, of course, it's not really real because once they started trying to implement a different algorithm, they realized, well, it doesn't quite work. The API is not quite what you need. So they have to rework a little bit the API, and that's part of the exercise. The other aspect is Kafka. So Kafka is a software that we actually use in Fabric, which uses, it's a message bus type of technology, which has a whole cluster, and it's quite a complex uh, system in and of itself. And so it just adds more to the baggage of, you know, setting up a whole fabric network and, and managing it. So uh, Raft is a, more like a, it functions as a library, and so it will simplify a lot the system. It's also a, a software that's available uh, on the, you know, it's open source, and it's actually, it's got, uh, it's, it's been hardened and, and reviewed uh, 
for several years, so it is trustworthy. And so we are actually implementing a new ordering service based on Raft, which again will have will be easier to manipulate, to, to you know, to manage from an operation point of view. And it will allow us to solidify this API so that then we can actually implement a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, algorithm that will be, you know, uh, earlier next year. Another aspect is serviceability. So, for instance, in the first version of Fabric, if you wanted to change anything, you basically had to shut down the whole network, upgrade things, change things, and restart. Obviously, in production, that's not an acceptable solution. So we made a lot of work to make the system more resilient to allow dynamic upgrades. So for instance, um, we, we have this notion of capabilities now, and you can upgrade nodes in different uh, times in different parts of the network, and the system won't crash. It does recognize who it's talking to. And so there's a lot of work that's done to try to make management of the network easier and also development easier because the tendency is, you know, those systems are quite complex. Let's not hide that fact. And so when things go wrong, people really scratch their head and you can spend a lot of time trying to understand the source of the problem. And so there's a lot of work that goes on into trying to make sure that people have the information they need. And then the last point I want to really talk about is improving the programming model. So I'm going to talk about this. I have just a few more slides, so bear with me. I'm running out of time, but we have a break now, so I can kind of cheat a little bit, if that's OK with you. Um, so Hyperledger, we actually had contributed IBM, contributed another piece of software, which is called Composer, Hyperledger Composer. And the idea was to s deliver a set of uh, functionality in the form of libraries and tools so that the application developer could use a level of uh, abstraction that's closer to their actual concern. So the problem with Fabric is very low level. As I said, you know, at the lowest level, we use level DB. It's a key value pair. What the key is, what the value is for Fabric is just bits, right? So if you want people, for instance, often ask, how do I store an image? It was like, well, you just put it in the form of bits and you store that. A fabric doesn't care what it is. It's up to the application to figure out how to go from one to the other. So Composer gives you a much, level, uh, much higher level of abstraction where you can actually define things like, you know, what, is, what are the assets that you want to manipulate on your network? What are the transactions that are supported on those assets? Right? at which point in time they are, and uh, that kind of stuff. The problem is Composer was done, honestly, it was a bit of a hack initially because the guys, they wrote that in Node.js, and essentially what they did is they, they created a, a, a chain code that basically installed a Java, uh, a Java virtual machine, JavaScript virtual machine, as the chain code, and then they run everything on top of that. The problem is, that means the Composer API is way up there, and the Fabric API is way down there. There's this mongoose piece in between, and then when you want to go from the other, you kind of scratch your head and you say, how does that work? How do the two correlate? Because they don't. So it's very hard to figure out how they go from one to the other. So after a couple of years working, or at least a good year, working on this, we actually decided to change this. <coughs> so let's be clear. This is, you know, driven by IBM's decision, but the community seems to be going along. The community, Hyperledger Composer is going to remain. It's, uh, it's not under IBM's control. What we have announced the to the community is that we will not keep pushing for further development of Composer, and instead, we're redirecting our resources to improve the APIs that are provided at the fabric level. From an IBM point of view, what we have today, we are offering is called IBM Blockchain Platform, is basically hosting Composer and Fabric onto the IBM Cloud on which you can build a blockchain. And this is a set of tools. And so we're moving towards a model where we have a bigger fabric and then no more Composer. What really is important to know is what it means from an application point of view. 
application developers will basically have new libraries, new packages that you'll be able to use along with the current APIs. So it's going to affect two sides, the SDK again and the chain code API. So the idea is that you're not going to have to just do like set and puts of data, but you will be able to actually have classes of objects. You will talk about contracts, you will talk about objects, you will talk to the network. And so there's a set of API that are under development. And some of this will actually be available in Fabric 1.4 by the end of the year. The work has been going on for quite a while already. So I'm going to stop there. Good news is, so I just wanted to highlight the fact that you're not alone. If you want to get started, there is different ways you can get started. Hyperledger Fabric, the community has a pretty big site with a lot of documentation. There are different uh, tutorials that you can start from to create a first network. Everything is dockerized, right? So we're talking about Docker containers. So it's actually, there's one common script that you can run to start installing all the things you need. And you can start a first network. Everything runs on your machine and it's pretty straightforward. And then you can start building applications and the likes. There are many different applications. There are samples that you can use. What's good to know is I said, you know, one of the key aspects of Fabric is to be flexible and provide a lot of uh, modularity. So the chain code, we support three different languages, Go, which is the built-in language, but also Node.js and Java. And then on the API, on the, on the SDK side, we also have Python. Uh, there are different APIs also with gRPC because that's Go, and we have a REST API coming back. I'm not going to get into detail now. Um, and what's important is there is plenty of help, so don't, you know, don't uh, suffer in your corner. Reach out. There's a big community. We essentially use two main, uh, as a community, two main uh, means of communication. There's a there's Hyperledger Fabric mailing list, which is open to everybody. And then there is uh, a rocket chat. This is chat.hyperledger.org. And we have many different channels uh, related to Fabric. And developers actually hang out on those channels all the time. And this is where all the work, the synchronization, coordination among the community happens. And you can reach out. IBM also has a huge amount of material available. So we have this IBM code uh, developer uh, website where you can find code patterns to start following. And, um, and, and we have, of course, the IBM blockchain platform where you have a starter that's actually free to get started and uh, you can use that basically provides all this into a hosted environment with nice tools. Okay, I'm going to stop there. It's a bit fast and I apologize, but the good news is Ingo has a, a follow-up session later where he's actually going into more of the details on what it means to actually work and develop code, both on the SDK side, uh, SDK side and, the, and the chain code. So you can, you know, if you're interested, you'll be here again after the break and you're happy to come and you will get a different perspective, but hopefully this will provide you kind of like the background of what's going on when you interact with the system. I'll be around all day and tomorrow, so if you have questions, please don't hesitate, come and reach out. Thank you very much.